Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Shreeli Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. One of our goal through this Conversations That Count is to bring in candidates that are running for primaries so you get to know them better and learn about the issues that they care about. As Re Republican Party congressional primaries are coming up this month, our focus on conversations that count will be in getting to know our candidates that are running in several congressional districts. One such good candidate that we have is Councilwoman Theresa Ellis. Theresa grew up with humble beginnings, working her family with her family in the auto repair shop. She paid her way through college, graduating with a business communication degree from George Mason University and worked with top financial institutions and later built and operated successful small businesses in Virginia's 10th Congressional District. She has also done a lot of work in healthcare management, expanding into marketing and communication for more than 25 years. Theresa is currently an elected city councilwoman serving as Manassas City Council member. I am honored to have Councilwoman Theresa Ellis on our conversations that count. There is a welcome, glad you took the time off, out of your busy campaign schedule to spend some time with me and our viewers. Thank you, Sheree. It's great to be here. It's great to see you again. Um, we're, as fellow Republican women, we have uh, run around in a few circles together. So I was really, really excited to hear that you started the, the, the concert conversations account. I think that's important to continue to have our voices get out to all of the, the citizens and members and also the voters so that they are aware of what's happening in the upcoming Firehouse primary, May 21st. Absolutely, Theresa. And I'm glad we are talking about this because not a lot of people are aware of the date. So we'll get a lot more detail into primary. So we are educating our voters to come in and choose the best candidate. And thank you for giving the plug to conversations that count. This has been the most humbling experience to talk to wise and passionate patri patriots such as you. So Theresa, let me ask you, you were the only Republican for a period of time, and you have outperformed every local Republican in the last five plus years in the city council world. I'm talking about specifically your elected position. That's a pretty impressive record. Talk to us more about your role and how you were able to keep that impressive record, considering that Manassas City is not a Republican hub by any means. That's correct. Um, Manassas is a very competitive area, the city of Manassas. I stepped up to run because no one else would run. And uh, people said, you're gonna lose. And I said, no, I'm gonna win. <laughs> and I felt like that was part of the problem. You had to have the confidence that what you were bringing to uh, the role was experience and the ability to, to, to do the job. That was very important. Now, since I already had a strong background in the city of Manassas, you know, by living, raising, and building my own business, I had um, done a lot of volunteer leader work, leadership work. So I had a pretty good, strong platform going into it. I connected with the people. I was, I was running for the right reason. I was running to serve the people and to do what was best for the community. And people realized that I was genuine. And so they came out to vote for me. So I was the only Republican for a while. And last year, um, when I was elected, my, one of my goals was to build the party because I felt like leadership was waning. To, you know, the morale was down. Um, so I fought hard to get another Republican on school board, another Republican on council. Um, we worked, I worked on Yunkin's, uh, Governor Yunkin's campaign for women for Glenn and also faith, lead, faith leaders for Glenn. Uh, that's what I did most of last year, actually. So getting elected and building the party and making sure people understood what we are all about. And I think we're doing well with that. But there is, I think one thing that you said that resonates very well with me is uh, how you worked in building the party. I feel a lot of candidates these days would like to just come overnight, want to 
uh, put their nomination in, uh, having served in the committees, does not understand the key stakeholders, doesn't understand the mission, vision about the GOP unit. It's extremely important that you work for the party and understand the dynamics and understand the key play, uh, and also utilize the party principles to do good for the community and serve the community before you decide to run. So I'm, I'm glad that we are on the same page on that. And, yeah. and that could be the reason you are elected because people saw that genuine, not only within the party, but your interest in serving the community, because we really right. want community to understand where we are coming from, not just the party. So- That's Correct, that's correct. Yeah, and as a Republican, I do go into some votes on city council where I'm the only vote going in for, one way which is the better way for the community and i'll get the majority vote because i know how to since i have a business background <laughs> very good at uh talking to people to make them understand what is best for the community and pack city hall bring the voters in put on that pressure and some of the votes that have come in there, some of the, the policies that have come before us that I had thrown out were because people came out and they gave their voice. And that's important. You have to be able to get things done. Um, if you are in a position, an elected position, and you can't get anything done for the benefit of the community for what we stand for, you're ineffective. So uh, that is uh, the key thing. I am an elected, uh, electable candidate that can do the job and get things done. That's really important. Um, a lot of people can run, and let me just be clear, we have a lot of great candidates running. So I'm gonna give them the credit that they deserve. Remember, I ran when no one else would run. So, so to see candidates stepping up is good. It's a good thing. That means the party is getting stronger. We're bringing more voters back to come bring them back to the party to actually participate in the process. And, um, you know, that's what we're, that's good. We've done a lot of work to get there. I know you have too. I know that you have done a lot behind the scenes to build this party and you stayed in the game and that's critical. Absolutely, so. Theresa. I think uh, um, uh, having multiple candidates, I know people criticize saying that, why do we need so many candidates? But you are, uh, that only brings in additional coverage for the party. Yes, it only, that's right. that's it right. only brings in additional votes. So, and it's a healthy competition. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone is that's capable right. of, uh, so why not? Right. So Theresa, you touched a little bit on your small business and entrepreneur um, and how you were able to get the skill, uh, get the stuff done. I know you were a liaison in economic de development plans on land use and the airport commission. You were also yes. a member of Prince William Chamber of Commerce. Talk to mm -hmm. us about your role as a liaison. What exactly do you do? Is that as part of elected members or is that something that you did it because you were an entrepreneur? Uh, well, before I was elected, I was in the Chamber of Commerce and I also was on the um, Manassas uh, uh, Airport Commission. I was the only woman um, and I had been the only woman for some, some time. When I, when I went onto the commission, I, you know, everyone's looking at me like, ooh, wow, a, a, a woman, you know? And um, I have two children in the Air Force. So I've always been very interested in aviation and uh, their careers. So it was something that I knew the language. I understood the industry just from a little bit that I've learned through them. And the airport was like a stone throw away from my house. It was pretty close. So uh, I was on there for a few years and then I ran and now I'm the council liaison for the airport. So I report back to council, everything that's happened. And the airport's done quite well. We are now the, the busiest general aviation airport in the state. We have huge, uh, like Chantilly Air just came in, huge FBO as well as Aurora Flights Sciences. Uh, Boeing is in there. Um, we have uh, an air, we created an airport zone so that we could, um, increase our businesses, not just airplanes, aircrafts, but aircraft and aviation type businesses, very technical. So it's done quite well. Now in economic development, 
that's a council uh, that's a council appointment. We all are working now as a council of the whole and many of these, but for three years, I was on economic development just uh, as a, a council liaison. And during the pandemic, I did a lot of work for businesses. So I was a liaison and um, as the businesses were falling apart, I literally was going out, I'm going above and beyond my duties and helping them set up outdoor places to, to be able to do their business, putting grant applications in their hands for the CARES Act money. Um, and I focused a lot on our um, Hispanic community because we are a majority minority mm -hmm. uh, right now. And they were really struggling. They weren't sure what was happening. There was a you know slight language barrier, so I went with I did I went knocked on businesses' doors. I didn't know if they were open or not. I'm like, here's the grant application, like who who can manage this for you? So we had like record breaking Hispanic business applications for grant money to stay open, and they're like, we never heard of half of these businesses. I was like, there are businesses. And we help them stay open because we reached out to them. And so that's really important. But economic development, we have a lot of businesses that have opened under that and expanded with the grants and funding. And uh, Micron is huge. I, I just got to give a plug for Micron. That's something that they invested $3 billion, one of the largest uh, single investments in the state. And that's with their expansions and semiconductors and, and memory chips. So that was also during economic development time that I was a liaison in 18, so. Yeah. There, is a, there is so much to unpack right there. I think you were, <laughs> a leader, you were an advocate, you were a humanitarian by helping our Hispanic community that was struggling mm -hmm. during that time. I also see that you are part of Master Gardeners, Beekeepers, Rotary International. <laughs> Yes. Suicide awareness, and you are also yeah. trying to work on finding a cure for Alzheimer's. So, how did you get to be part of all these multiple noble organization? And uh, you were also a leader. It's not like you were just participating or just being a liaison. You were president of some of these clubs too. Mm -hmm. So, how did you get into all of these? In fact, I I was impressed when I saw um, a picture about beekeepers. I think you just posted. <laughs> yeah. Day. And I'm following you, I was that's pretty impressive. So, how did you get into all these uh, multiple? Oh, so, so, we have seven children in our family my husband, George, and I. We have six daughters and one son, and uh, spent a lot of time outside with the kids. My yeah. first volunteer position was really well, I don't know if it's position, but master gardener. I, I learned how to um, plant native and also take care of things in a in a, in a good way, you know? So that is where I actually started. The children were young and it was something that we could all do together. There's a lot of volunteer work in order to get a master gardener um, uh, training. It's not that easy really. <laughs> I had to take botany. It, it, it's pretty comprehensive, good group, the Virginia Co-op Extension, very good group. Um, so needless to say, um, I was building my business and raising kids and working in healthcare. And so I started getting involved, of course, then in the chamber, as well as, you know, the schools. I did a lot. It was on the Education Foundation. I don't even know if I listed that in there. I was a CTE advisory group, um, so that career technical education. I found that the schools were suffering, and I took a tour, and I said, as a business owner in the city, I'm like, I want to see what's happening with the schools. I don't understand what is, what's going on. And I was pleasantly surprised. I said, I think there's opportunities that uh, are out there for the students. And so the CTE program was just getting started. I said, we need to connect the businesses with the students to help them. Not all of them are gonna go to college. They're looking at trades, they're looking at opportunities, externships, internships, um, apprenticeships. And so I actually did one of the programs where my company, I brought a student in and, and taught her about management communication for a semester as an intern. And so I had a lot of experience there. Going from that, then I joined Rotary Club because they were all businesses. I ended up becoming the area governor for Prince William County and Manassas City. 
and we did amazing fundraising um, and events like Flags for Heroes. I, I started that in Northern Virginia where we put 100, 200 flags in the cities to honor our, our heroes, military, any heroes. Um, and then I became a beekeeper with my husband <laughs> where we started getting interested in the decline of pollinators. And I said, you know, some simple behavior change can really make a difference. And as you probably know, pollinators are key to our growing food source. Absolutely. So I started the designation when I got elected for the city of Manassas to be a Bee City USA, which is a national designation like a Tree City USA. And we were the first city in Northern Virginia. And we started a Manassas Bee Festival, which is our second one is June 25th. And it had thousands of people last year. It, it's, it, it's a great thing. You know, it brings together businesses, um, musicians, and we did a lot of work with the scouts. We set up a community apiary um, and just bringing awareness of planting native plants to attract pollinators. It's, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a simple way to do it. And then the Red Cross, so I, I could go on and on. Um, when the pandemic hit, we had a severe blood shortage because the blood donation sites shut down. They were too small. So because I have a background in healthcare management, I reached out and I said, hey, can I use uh, my clinic, one of the clinics as a, a place for blood donations? And they said, it's too small. I said, I'll tell you what, what do you need? So I reached out to all the churches and big community. I said, can you open up your gym? Can you open up your community room? We need to have this. And so I ended up becoming the chairperson of the biomedical committee of the Red Cross and our blood supply just, we, we fulfilled our expectations and um, actually broke some records. So that's how that happened. There's um, all the things that you're talking about. Sometimes uh, I am surprised how much we don't know about our own candidates. You are <laughs> such, an, uh, such an accomplisher. If I look at your website, yes, I understand your positions, but I can possibly not know the details. I think that's the beauty of these conversations. It is, yeah. Let yeah. us really get to hear about your background. I mean, you have a rich background. You did a lot of entrepreneurial, a lot of humanitarian. You took a lot of initiatives uh, uh, in uh, in ensuring that the community is taken care of. Kudos to you. Well, I'm a problem solver. You know, I, I think that's my, uh, one of my strengths. It's like problem, common sense solution. I don't like, to, I am extremely, fiscal responsibility is extremely important to me. Money doesn't solve everything. Sometimes it takes a lot of um, um, connecting community relationships as well as awareness to get things done. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in sweat equity <laughs> as well. <laughs> There's some spending of course that we have to look at that's priority to our country. Um, but needs and wants are different. Yeah. And we have service organizations in our communities like the Rotary, Lions Club, Kiwanis. You know, I was actually the president of the Inter-Service Club Council, which is all of those service organizations. They were on, I was their president for two years. And we did um, volunteer of the year awards and um, we did scholarship fairs that I, I initiated to understand the power of volunteerism. People want to help. They want to know how to help. I started uh, getting involved with the Interfaith Council. That was another thing during the pandemic. I was uh, one of the council members that logged into that when they had their meetings. When you're looking at our uh, houses of um, our faith-based um, organizations, some are collecting coats, some are collecting food. You know, let's make sure this is we're talking to each other. We don't need all, to all collect coats. You know, let's get organized and see what you need and let people know what you have. So when I'm a business communication, you know, my degree in that, um, I'm very, very, communication is so important and connection. 
And I actually won alumni of the year for George Mason University in 2019 because of all the work I've done with uh, the degree that I received from them. So I think that is uh, that is such an um, accomplishment because I know George <laughs> Mason has a lot of great grads, a lot of um, you know, it's a great quality education. I really enjoy yes. that university. Great. So Teresa, I wish you were in Board of Supervisors. I'm sure, I'm not sure if you're aware, Fairfax County Board of Supervisors are trying to are trying to raise the taxes. And that's one of my pet peeves. Needs and wants are so very different. And yes. uh, you just really have to be fiscally responsible. So right. I'm going to be speaking at uh, one of the board, board of Supervisors meeting, just talking about the same things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know, Teresa, when I looked at your website, in multiple places that you believe you mentioned that you are out there to protect the water integrity, individual rights and liberties, which you and I understand. But I, but some of these terminologies, regular people may not and may not understand where we are coming from. Can you elaborate on your positions for those people that don't hear these terms on a daily basis or is not part of their vocabulary uh, on a daily basis? What do you mean when you say you want to protect water integrity or individual rights and liberties? What are you referring to? Um, yeah, th so there's a couple of things. I think even our party, um, any any candidate and party that they're affiliated with, they have to make sure even with our candidates, I'm gonna stand up for our candidates right now, all of us, should have an opportunity to um, connect to voters. Like what you're doing is great. You're giving candidates an opportunity to connect with voters if they're seeking that information. Not all voters can uh, be a part of a committee. Not all voters can um, log on to Zoom, you know, at a certain time or go to a meetup. But when you're putting things out there where you're streamlining and also saving it and probably putting it on YouTube or however your uh, platform is, continuing that to bring more awareness of what is happening with primaries and candidates is very, very important. So many people don't know what's going on. Now, voter integrity. I do believe that ID should be shown when people vote. Um, I almost think it's uh, insulting that people can't do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was in FedEx the other day to ship a package and I had to show an ID. They wouldn't let me send something to my grandson for his birthday because I didn't, you know, I had to go to my car and get my ID. I thought, wow, that's so interesting. So what do people do if they don't have an ID to ship something for FedEx? You know, it's part of who we are in a country to have an ID. So I don't understand why that's even an issue. I'm, and there's actually many voters that agree with me that are, you know, they say this is silly. Um, when it comes to election integrity, so having elections that are all different throughout the country, uh, there can be things that happen. Like, for example, when I ran at one time, I went through uh, uh, an actual recount canvas because of uh, the process. The machines that they had were all touchscreen. And there was all kinds of things that went wrong with that. So because the process was not well, done well, um, I was not happy and ended up, we got machines that were now paper scanned and now two ways to confirm the vote. Um, so I saw firsthand, if you don't have the right type of equipment to count the votes for ballot, you know, once the ballots are in to make sure our elections are secure that's important. I mean, we have to get that across the board in our country to have make sure make sure our elections are being run as fairly as possible with the right equipment and the right process. Because as you know, it's a lot of work to run. And for a candidate to get to a point where there is a possible um, question about how everything was counted or processed, that's ridiculous. Acceptable, yes. And, you know, and I saw it firsthand just because of equipment, equipment problems and, and also making sure that we have people at polls the day of the election. Now for Governor Yunkin, um, his race, we pulled out people. We, we had the power of the people there. 
we had poll watchers, we had people standing out there giving out information. Um, that is holding the precincts accountable. And as you can see, we had a victory. And that's what that's what it takes. Uh, uh, there is a, no, no, I think that's a great example for our viewers to understand where you're coming from. I mean, I think you said something about um, uh, not showing ID or showing ID. In mm -hmm. fact, I think it's quite uh, humiliating when they keep saying that we are doing this for people of color. I'm a person of so I said, I'm fully capable of uh, getting an ID <laughs> and showing it where needed and understand the importance of it. So for them to say they're doing it for people of color like me actually, actually makes me feel humiliated. I'm like, right. Don't it's an it. insult. It's an yeah. insult. In fact, I think uh, it gives me more confidence uh, at every step of the way if they're asking me for an ID because it makes me feel like this entire, not only voter integrity, but when I go to FedEx, uh, when I'm taking a plane or when I'm uh, uh, going and buying something that should be bought only by adults. I mean, I think yeah. it gives me confidence about the system of living. So uh, I am completely on board about the voter integrity. So Teresa, I know there was a lot of redistricting that happened. I knew you wanted to run a paid. So for, uh, folks are still trying to figure out if they're indeed in 10th district or they have moved, been moved around. I was in 10th, I moved to 11th. Uh, can you explain the boundaries of 10th congressional district so folks sure. that are listening to us know whether they belong to your district, if they can vote for you? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, my website is Teresa Ellis for Congress.com. And if you go on there, the very front page, the very first paragraph, there is a, a link that will take you right to the map where you can plug in your address and see where you are. Um, I can tell you briefly, it's a little, there's a couple places that are, you know, you, you might want to check, but Loudoun County is in the 10th, all of Loudoun County. All of Rappahannock County is in the 10th all of Fauquier County is in the 10th. Um, Western Prince William is in the 10th and it's almost cut in half. <laughs> and uh, so that's where, if you're kind of in the middle of Prince William, you will want to check that map and make sure that you are um, in the right place. If not, you're in the seventh. So East Prince William is in the seventh. Uh, Manassas City, of course, is in the 10th as well as Manassas Park, all of Manassas Park. Now for Fairfax, little bottom part of Fairfax. I, I think it's really funny. I'm like, they couldn't have just pushed all of that. You know, I'm, I'm, it's just interesting how they did that. They were going for a population amount, but Clifton is in the 10th. So that is one where you really do have to look at the map. There's Clifton, there's I think parts of Yatesport Road is in the 10th. It's a very strange, there's certain precincts. Um, I think there's like four or five precincts that are in the 10th. Uh, so I can give you them if you want me to. They're oh, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great, uh, great uh, overview of um, yes. how redistricting happened. Uh, so while yes. we are at redistricting topic theory, so in 2016, we secured over 52% votes in 10th Congressional District. And mm -hmm. in the previous election in 2020, we only secured a little over 43%. I mean, that's a da drastic decline. What do you think changed in just four years in 10th Congressional District? Uh, I mean, have you guys done some analysis to see what happened? You, what, you mean what happened that made it more competitive for Republicans? I, I think what happened that made us go from 52% to 43%. Uh, Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I do believe that media is not on our side, <laughs> for sure. I mean, that's definitely true. You know, media, uh, we, it's far, really hard to find news that's actually credible. So at George Mason, you know, I took news reporting journalism. I understand credible sources, and, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people believe what they hear. And um, it's important that we have more educated voters so when media started exploding, especially social media um, and the messaging for the opponents, the other side got out in a very negative way. I think that we are now understanding as a party how we have to make sure we get out there in front of that. That's really important. We're going to win this one. The midterms, we're going to take it. I have no doubt. 
And I know how to win a general. I, I, that is important. You have to have a candidate that is going to win the general election. I want in a competitive city, you know, a city that has all the components of a large city, it has an airport, it has, it has train, we have our own water source, we have our own electric company. We are a very self-contained city. And during the pandemic, economically, we did okay because we have a diverse economy. We've worked really hard to make sure that we were going to be sustainable no matter what. Um, and even though, like I said, it's a competitive area, but I know how to win because I know how to talk to people. I understand. I know how to connect to people. I know how to get down and really connect in some way that they can, I'm a candidate that they can get behind. That's important. Um, Jennifer Wexton, as an elected official for four years, I saw her maybe three times. And now the city of Manassas was always in the tents. And so I don't know if she was spending all her time in a different area, but from what I can tell, she didn't, she kind of voted with Nancy Pelosi every time. Yeah, yeah. You see well, her you in know, a lot of pictures with Nancy Pelosi, but not in the community. Exactly. She just voted that way. Rappahannock, Fauquier, Manassas City, Manassas Park, and the bottom of Fairfax, they don't want to get lost in the shuffle. You know, they, Loudoun is a, is a big part of the 10th. Everyone matters to me. Um, I feel like she's not connected with her district. And a lot of that, actually, I know that. Um, this is another good example. Uh, we had the CARES Act money. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I bring this experience too with policy. At the end of the year, we still had money left over from the CARES Act. When the American Rescue Plan was unveiled, we were gonna get 50, like $50 million. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, does this person even know what we are, need or don't need? And really more important, what we don't need. And what did everyone else get? A lot more, you know, because we were a small city. So talk about irresponsible spending. That's your money. Absolutely. Okay. And so, and then when the levels, when it came down to, uh, really being dispersed. There was le many levels of bureaucracy to even use the money, which I have to be honest, I'm like, send it back, <laughs> you know? No, if it, it, it was complex. Needless to say, if there was actually a, a jurisdiction that really needed that money, it would have been difficult for them. So that, that was, a to me, that was a feather in somebody's cap. Say, I'm gonna give you $50 million, you know? Not even looking if that was really something a jurisdiction needed and what they needed it for. Very poor planning, that's irresponsible. That alone is a reason to run, to take that person out of office. Absolutely, so, I think everything that you're saying, Teresa, makes so much sense. I, I sincerely hope a lot of people that are listening right now will, con uh, will decide to share this video. I have no doubt that we have such great candidates like you, if you get through primaries, a hundred percent will take back this time in midterms. Um, so while we are on the topic there, so what is your strategy for winning primaries? As I said, la, looks like all the candidates that are out there, all strong candidates, uh, you're an elected, so it definitely adds value because you, prove, you are a proven leader. You know how to win elections. And then we also have one or two other candidates that are already in that place too, where mm -hmm. they have won elections. So what differentiates you from other candidates? Do you have a different strategy for winning primaries? What's your overall strategy? Um, yeah, so I am not a career politician. You know, I've, like I said, I'm finishing up my first term of four years. I ran because no one else would run. Um, that is uh, because I wanted to serve the people. And it is all about that. It is making sure I serve with the information, all the experience that I bring to the table, I'm ready to work. I'm job ready. I can sit down and get right to work. And um, so that's that's something that moving into the primary, I want people to remember, you have to have the experience. You have to have someone ready to work. You have to have somebody that is motivated, motivated to actually serve the people. 
who are the people that the people in Virginia, I have a strong support system. Um, we have worked in our business as well as in all the organizations all over Northern Virginia. So we have, you know, strong contacts to, um, and that's just with people. Uh, that's why it's important. Um, when it comes to like endorsements, I have always shied away from them. I want to be honest. It's like, I'm not running to be backed by somebody else's agenda. I'm, I'm running for the people of Virginia. And that, you know, I have endorsements from doctors, business people, teachers, students, um, law enforcement. That's who I want behind me. And I've always went like that in my, in my past uh, elections. And I found that that was a stronger way to go forward, to be honest. So, um, and I'm one of the few elected. So that's, that's moving forward, you know, with strategy. It's just showing people who I am. I'm doing a dining tour. <laughs> so this has been going on since uh, I think November. I'm just going around to all different areas in the 10th and inviting people to come in. At first I started with dessert, come in, desserts on me. And then we did the appetizers and we're having another meetup uh, and people, you know, will help co-sponsor it for me people in the community. <laughs> and we're having one in Warrington on the 12th. It's called Mead and Greet oh. because they also are interested in the beekeepers. So we're going to have mead there, which is like a honey wine <laughs> for people that like that. Um, and also some local honey. And we, you know, that's on my website. You can come in. We're also going to be out to Rappahannock. I'm going to be up at Loudoun. You know, we're just continuing to tour. It's like, come in and talk. I want to hear what you have to say. And I want you to learn about what I can do for you. There is a, that's very, very interesting. I think meet and greets are the best way to know people. And I think you, you have a point when you talk about endorsements. At the end of the day, having endorsements from national figures, it, it's helpful to get the name out. But at the end of the day, I would love to have endorsement from my own family because they mm -hmm. trust they are the support system. I want to have uh, from, from my coworkers, uh, from the business um, uh, uh, affiliations that I'm associated because they really know who I am and they can vouch right. for my leadership skills. Uh, so I think right. that's a very, very, a very uh, innovative way to think about it. And I'm sure voters will see through that uh, clearly. And I think they'll understand where exactly you're coming from. Well, and I think the voters are looking for a fresh perspective. I really do. I think they're looking for people that can get things done, who they can believe in, who are going to work hard for them, for them, work hard for them. That's, that's the, the key right there. And so, and I'm, I'm so energized by it. You know, I, I love meeting people. I love hearing about uh, their stories and how I can help them. I, one other thing that I started before we move on, um, I started a program called Shadow for a Day. It's in its fifth year. So remember I was talking about, I was in the Education Foundation, CTE, and I could see there was a disconnect with students trying to get jobs or have mentorships. So the CTE program was really having a tough time getting started. Um, so I started my own program and it was called Shadow for a Day. And it brought professionals that want to work with students from plumbers to politicians, to doctors, to uh, nonprofits. It's a huge network. And they wanted to just connect with a group. And so students, this was before COVID, of course, students would come in and meet with a whole network of these various professions and they would share cards. And many of them got jobs or at least uh, learned about the profession, letters of recommendation. They would go in and shadow them for a day. Some of them got jobs with them after that. It was almost like a little interview process. So this is my fifth year and I'm, I'm starting that. I just started interviewing. I'm now doing it all virtual. We're doing, I just send videos. When COVID hit, I started interviewing professions, professionals and different types of uh, uh, careers. And that had much, for, had huge reach, thousands of people. So I thought, wow, this is great. This is benefiting students all over the country. 
And it's a great program that I would love to bring to Congress. You know, it's not just a leadership program. It is a, is a connection, career connection program. It's really much more, it, it's a great thing. <laughs> I think young people need that. That gives them a good segue to the real workforce. I think they kind of understand what a real work situation would look like. I think that's a great idea. Well, there's some students that might want to be a doctor, but they don't know. They don't have a relationship with a doctor where they can understand the path or maybe their parents, they don't have that knowledge as well. Um, so they can connect with one of my doctors who will show them the way. And sometimes to get into a medical school, you have to have, re, you know, you have to have referrals. You have to have people giving recommendations. So this is a huge part of that, and so it's been very successful. And so in our hospital, we do a lot of internship programs, and I think the things that uh, students learn just by observing us uh, and being part of our meetings is monumental, and that, that's what tells them whether they're really passionate about it or they're just getting into the career just so. Uh, they have a good education, but because that's not going to get them anywhere far ahead in their lives. Yeah, so, you have to be a part of my network. <laughs> <laughs> I sure would love to be. So uh, there is a, um, let, let me talk about 10th Congressional District. I like to do demographic deep dive. I'm just a very data driven person. I know 10th Congressional District has 7% African Americans, about 12% Asians, and another 12% Hispanics. I'm sure you're as part of your campaign process, you're deep diving. Mm -hmm. That's about 30% from minority communities. Mm -hmm. And um, yep. uh, I, I, at Fairfax GOP, I do what is called as community engagement strategy and um, community engagement uh, to kind of invite minority community leaders, interfaith leaders, uh, and uh, just people from different diverse communities to kind of talk about their issues. Uh, this is a very innovative concept that we've done, but Democrats, as you know, have done this for years. Uh, granted, they have done it with the wrong motivation to kind of capture their votes and kind of um, win the elections. And we are doing it with an intention of really getting to know people, getting to know the issues. So once we are elected, uh, we can do better for those communities. So what do you? What are the strategies do you think you can impart once you win your primaries in order to reach out to these outreach communities? I am I am an immigrant myself, so I'm extremely passionate about ensuring that immigrants understand the Republican values because the minute they understand the values that we offer, they will vote for us. I'm not worried about That's getting right. their votes. I just want yeah. them to understand where we are coming from. So what, what do you think would be your outreach strategy once you are um, mm -hmm. one of those um, elected candidates or out of yeah. primary? Uh, so I'm a small business owner, and I've already met with quite a few people in the different uh, minority communities that are businesses who have also connected me to, you know, faith-based organizations and the different um, communities that they um, have connections. And we just kept, or we, we continue to build on that. Um, I agree with you. Once they understand what we're really all about, and that's opportunities, you know, like, I said, I, I grew up very humble beginnings and, you know, I, my parents didn't want me to go to college. They're like, you're going to work in the shop. That's, you know, and the trades are hugely important. I mean, we have a huge trade deficit right now. Um, but I went to college and paid for it and built my own business after that. And I took advantage of opportunities that were there for me that I created. And that is a message that I think for our, um, our different demographics that we have that we can relate to. We, we work hard, we're faith-based, we're family-based. Um, so that's important. We're on their side. You know, um, I met with a business owner up in the Loudoun area. He is from India. And he said, we're not the best voters unless mm -hmm. we know somebody and we can get behind them. And he said, I believe in you and I'm going to, you know, you're going to introduce you to everyone that I know, and we're going to just keep going. He actually knows you. <laughs> and I sent him this, so I said, Hey, you got to tune in, but that's important, you know, to find the leadership in different communities to continue to build on that and say, this is what we can offer you opportunities. Education is huge 
for everyone in the district. It's extremely important to people that have come to this area so their children can have a better life through education. And that is how Glenn Youngkin won. He tapped into that and he won and that worked out well. But we also have to make sure there's gonna be career paths and jobs you know, for their, their, their students and freedoms. The, the freedoms, making sure that people have the freedoms that they, they, they have deserve and they earn. And this is what immigrants are looking for. So uh, it's, I think you, you really read the pulse of immigrants. That is all uh, immigrants are looking for, right? Quality education for all students. Uh, I think mm -hmm. not only we need to pick that as a topic because Yankin won uh, and Parents Matter, Gardner Yankin, but I think it is mm -hmm. the right thing to do. Well, a couple of things that you mentioned on the website is about quality education for all students, regardless of zip code, 100% agree. That ties into school choice, parental yes. rights, and so on and so forth. You also support infrastructure, quality healthcare, mm -hmm. a big deal for me. Public safety, which I think is a pulse of immigrants. We all want to be safe. Right. Sound. Mm -hmm. Uh, these all help education, families, communities, and the economy for our country, for, and even for Virginia to thrive. But these are, I always say, very lofty ideas, which um, are very hard to accomplish it all. Mm -hmm. So where do you plan to start if you're an elected person? Where do you plan to start, and how do you plan to prioritize? Yeah, so, you know, you got to look, you have to also remember candidates, what do they bring into the table that they can help solve problems. Um, I do think that when you get to Congress, um, I've seen this through the pandemic, the power of local government and the states. You, we have to make sure they retain their power. We have seen federal mandates and how they can destroy a country. Uh, when you get to Congress, the one thing you wanna do is make sure power is contained on that level. <laughs> That's really important. Um, what President Trump, when he gave states the power to control how they were gonna handle the pandemic, that's why we have parts of our country that survived. You know, that's why you have the Southern states did uh, better than some of the other states who had like Virginia, you know, going on strict lockdown, especially with schools. My grandsons live in Georgia because my, my son is in the Air Force in Georgia and they only missed a couple, just a short period of time of school, very short. It was like a couple weeks or a couple months um, and they went back to school. So they made the honor roll. They played all their sports that were, there were some sports that they had to not do. But uh, to me, I'm like, that just shows you how important it is to let states control what they know that they're, the people li that live there need. Now, there's some states that didn't do so well because they had governors that decided to have government overreach and lockdown. And, but as a country, we have parts of the country that made it through it and actually some thrived like my sister lives in Florida she's like stop coming here <laughs> you know everybody's <laughs> moving down here please don't come here <laughs> we have enough people here um so that's important when you need to get into congress make sure that we keep this administration in check or get them out you know and flip that house take control and Another hold person. people accountable that's, that's the first thing we got to do um, the next thing is, since I'm a business owner, I understand how important it is that we do not lose the small business population and we continue to let entrepreneurs come and, and open their businesses and small businesses thrive um, and healthcare. And healthcare is one of those things. Um, so 30 years I've been in the trenches with this and you have a lot of experience mm -hmm. as well. I have seen, you know, the crippling of healthcare. I'm, I'm worried. I'm really worried about healthcare. I'm worried about the doctor shortage that's coming. I'm worried about our aging population. We might not have the providers to take care of them. I have six daughters. They are all professional women. They're going to have their families late. You know, they're, there's not that many people having children you know, they're trying to get careers ready and get through the pandemic. I mean, on a whole, the aging population is going to outgrow that younger population. So I see that. 
so how can we make sure our healthcare professionals are, are ready for that? And, um, you know, Medicare, we, gotta, we have big, big problems with Medicare. It's possible yeah. going bankrupt, you know, or if it's on the news now. So I can bring a different perspective to healthcare. I bring the business side of it. I've seen it. When I first got into healthcare, HMOs and PPOs were just now coming around. And I said, oh, this is a huge mistake. I feel like, you know, healthcare is, 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 is they're, they're going to have their entire um, livelihood controlled by insurances. And that's exactly what happened. And um, you know that you're in it now. So we have to make sure that we have our healthcare professionals, we have to have to have to, the ability to take care of this aging population that's coming. So that's another thing. Um, the military, I'm a military mom. My only son, my male daughter, Air Force, sent him to war. I've seen it. I, you know, they are, they were in it, but we had to take care of families that, you know, make sure they had what they needed. Um, we have to be very careful how we send off our, our, our young men and women into battle and be prepared for that. Make sure they're supported if that's the mission and make sure we take care of our veterans, which many are not. And we have to take care of our military families. And this is the month of the military child, just to make a plug for that. And, and I'm actually, person. my grandsons are in the other room, so. <laughs> Uh, uh, Teresa, I, I am quite impressed. Uh, I mean, you have what uh, seven kids, beautiful family, beautiful grandkids, uh, a wonderful supporting husband, and you still want to get into politics. Uh, you know, it uh, sometimes can get to be a dirty game and a tough game, but you are up for challenge, so which is quite incredible, um, if uh, if you ask me. So, uh, and you briefly mentioned about being a military mom as well. That kind of brings me to the thought that you fully understand the sacrifices of uh, military veterans and their families, especially those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a sizable veteran community in Northern Virginia and quite a few mm -hmm. of them live in 10th district as well. So if yes. you are elected to be a representative of these veterans, I would love to know what will you do to allow our veterans get better access to healthcare with such a rich healthcare experience. Not many candidates understand healthcare. Uh, right. I, right. I live and breathe healthcare on a, diff, on a daily basis. So I understand what is unaffordable healthcare, what is Medicaid expansion, what does not mm -hmm. having enough dollars in Medicaid, what does PPO affect? So I understand, but not many candidates understand. So it's kind of refreshing to know that you actually do mm -hmm. have that kind of healthcare background. So what do you think you will be able to do to allow our veterans to have better access to healthcare and other services that they need and also deserve? Right, they, they deserve to have what, you know, they, they have done the ultimate sacrifice no matter what. Many of them come out with disabilities, um, mental health issues. Uh, they might be offered mental health uh, uh, types of services and they don't always take it because there could be some type of, um, oh, you know, I'm not going to do that because th there's a perception that they shouldn't show that. Um, some military people don't want to go to base health care because it will, could be on their record. They prefer to go to the private um, to make sure that they can get it taken care of without having scrutiny. Um, that's getting a little more complicated, but they should have the freedom to get health care where they, where they want to get health care. I guess that's where I'm getting at. Um, and it, it should be a private matter. Um, so they get it. Uh, the, my son's been in for 18 years. He'll, he'll get out, in two, I think two more years, he, he's going to retire. He's going to put in 20. And he already said, you know, he's got some things going on because he was in special, special forces that will, you know, prevent him from doing types of jobs, but making sure the transition as well into the real world and being aware of what opportunities they have. That's another thing I would like to make sure is happening um, so that they're not just floundering. Some vets become you know, homeless because they're not sure what to do. You know, they're not giving that path like they, they, they should have been given. 
Um, some bases are better than others, some, but we have to make it across the board and they have to know what benefits they have coming out as veterans. So uh, military families, there's some enlisted military families on food stamps. You know, they, they, they line up to get food at, food at the food closets and um, they're really, so many struggle and they don't wanna talk about that because that's, they think they're just doing their duty to support their, you know, their husband or wife. They don't wanna make any waves. That, that, that's, that, that shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be difficult. That, that job is tough. You know, they do get benefits that are good if they understand them. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's just bringing awareness. So I think they should, they, they should be on a pedestal. I, I know what they go through. Teresa, I think you said one word that, that you won't, only if they understand. I think education is very important. Mm -hmm. um, as military personnel, they have done whatever they can to protect us, and it's time that we protect them and we take care of them. So yes. uh, I am uh, totally, totally for it. And I, I can't even imagine any community members disagreeing with you whatsoever. Teresa, I do want to let you know that you have several comments on Facebook that oh, are I do. Okay. Super positive. I've had a listener, Dave, saying that stay in the fight. Let's go, Theresa and Nancy, one of our uh, our own person, saying that without election integrity, there is no freedom. It's very easy to get an ID. Um, and your own campaign manager saying, what a great leader you are. So <laughs> just, uh, it's, I mean, sometimes I, I say that uh, instead of having a um, big time endorsement, your own people that work with you and for you, somebody like Brett endorsing you and saying you're a great leader <laughs> or tells a story about uh, what a leadership you are. So Teresa, this has been a pleasure. I mean, I, uh, I thought I know you very well. I've watched you. I met you once in um, one of the Christmas party a couple of years back. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I, uh, mm -hmm. I, and I thought I know you very well, but I it, this was quite enlightening. I'm surprised that with the full-fledged family life that you have with seven kids, how you were able to be part of it. Uh, so many committees and actually lead it, not just go in as volunteer for a day or two, but actually lead. That tells that you're fully capable, like most women are multitasking, leading. <laughs> so we are in the last couple minutes. Uh, let us know if anything I missed. If you feel like, Shree, you didn't talk to me about it. I would love for my voters to know this is a great time you can do your pitch about your website how to vote for you in the primaries okay, how to you. donate how to volunteer this would be okay a yeah absolutely well having seven children you have a built-in campaign team um and a husband they're behind me a thousand percent of the way um they are all writing postcards for me right now saying vote for my mom you know my sister vote for my sister vote for my wife you know um we also have a huge network base from them, honestly. They're very active in the community. Like my daughter, she's on Parks and Rec. She's with the Chamber of Commerce, you know, one of my daughters. Uh, having the children in the military, we have a strong connection with many vets in the, in the 10th district already. Um, that's important to have your family behind you because it is not easy to be a candidate. But we're tough. We're, we are a really, we're a strong family. And we, are, we believe in the, the cause that we need to take back a seat and flip that house. I need to make sure that we get this country back on track. We're, we are at a crossroads right now. We are going to lose our country if we don't get this under control. The spending is ridiculous. And that's something that crosses party lines. People do not want to pay the kind of money they're paying right now just for necessities of life. They also, you're seeing it now, interest rates are starting to go up. The future for our young population, they're scared. Are they ever going to be able to buy a house? Are, they, are, my, are my six daughters going to be able to have a family, you know, and and give them what they need with what's coming down the road with the cost of even education. So I'm doing it for the future of this country and I am a tough person. You know, I've been the only woman on many board meetings, boards. I've led many boards as the only woman. <laughs> 
and I know how to get things done. And that's critical for what we want to get done. So just to say, I am of course building volunteers all the time. You can go on my website, it's TeresaEllisForCongress.com. Everything's on there, there's a contact form, you can reach out. I need you to get out and vote for me. Number one, number one choice, it's important. We have an early voting day, May 12th at the Middleburg Barn only. It's a Thursday from four to 8 p.m. One day, one place. If you can't make the, the Republican Party uh, primary, which is going to be May 21st, Saturday from nine until four. So you can go on my website, like I said, and you can find out where to vote. Loudon and Prince William have uh, three different locations. Might not be your normal voting place. So take a look at that. It's based on precincts. Rappahannock, Falkir, Manassas City, Manassas Park, and that part of Fairfax, they have one place to go. It's a little easier. So just go in, it's gonna be ranked choice voting. I'm your number one and I'm gonna win the general. That's important. We need to take back this house. It's time. Absolutely, Theresa. I think I agree with everything that you just said. I also want to give props uh, props to Brett, Brett, who is part of your uh, campaign <laughs> team. That, um, I have seen him be part of campaigns. He's a hard worker. So you have right people next to you. I can tell you that. Uh, sometimes yeah. uh, your campaign is as strong as the people that you recruit and you recruit a yeah. great team. And we, have, we have a very diverse group of people. We have um, uh, we have uh, some high school, some college kids. We have bilingual people. We have women. We have we have everyone under the sun to help us get to this because they believe in me and they've known me for a long time. Excellent. And uh, I'm excited about being your next congresswoman. Theresa, thank you so much for joining us. This was a wonderful com um, conversation. I wish you the very best. If you are the chosen candidate and you move on to general, which I have no doubt you will, I hope you come by so we can do some deep dive into many issues that are plaguing our country. I would love to yes. get your take on the current war, war that's going mm -hmm. on. I would love to understand about the inflation, staggering gas prices the economy and so on and so forth. Um, especially the issues that are plaguing our 10th congressional district the, with regards to internet broadband access in some of the rural communities and a little more yes. deep dive into different sects of um, uh, immigrant communities. I wanna understand uh, more about your involvement into interfaith communities and so on and so forth. I, I would love to. I thank you for coming on. I thank you, thank you. for your engagement. Viewers, that, that is uh, um, our councilwoman, Ellis. Uh, she's running Thank for you. Congress, Virginia 10. Uh, please feel free to subscribe to Fairfax GOP Facebook page. Please share this video far and wide. We want the entire 10th Congressional District to hear Theresa's thoughts and her vision and strategy for not only just winning, but also for the entire Congressional District. Uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m., we will have Joe Babb, who is running for 11th Congressional District. Hope hmm. you all will join in and uh, listen to him speak about his vision and strategy. Have a wonderful good evening. God bless Theresa. God bless her beautiful family and grandchildren. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.